to Andrew. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Daniel, who's going to talk about rare disease association analysis. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel. I'm from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. I'm also a visiting scientist at University of Cambridge, and I'm very happy to be here uh, to talk to you today about some work that I've done in collaboration with Professor Andrew Mumford, who is also here today. And yeah, great. Um, so Rare Disease Association Analysis of the 100,000 Genomes Project. So um, this little diagram on the right shows the anatomy of a, a rare disease sequencing study where you start with uh, collecting participants, sequencing them, doing QC, doing variant um, prioritization and statistical analysis, functional validation of the best signals, and then discoveries and extra diagnoses. So our, our part of this is the statistic, statistical association analysis. And this, this work that I'm presenting today arose from um, start, starting about 12 or so years ago um, in the NIHR bioresource rare diseases sequencing project. Um, so the, our aim was to do a cohort-wide association <laughs> analysis. And the starting point was working with VCF files. So we had VCF files, which would be in terabytes of size. They are um, difficult to work with in the sense of needing data to be decompressed, to be read into um, analysis programs. If you need to make an add a, a, a sample to the file, you have to rewrite the whole thing. And so we started looking at, and additionally, we're really interested in the rare variants because we're, we're focused on looking at these rare monogenic uh, diseases um, who were the participants of the study. So we're only really interested in a tiny fraction of the data that's contained in them. So we started looking at um, better ways of working with the data. And over time, these um, this work was put together. So one thing that um, we wanted was to be able to I, um, query the genotype data, the annotation data, and the phenotype data in a simple way that was independent of file systems. So you could write a portable analysis and run it on one data set or another if you had data formatted the same way. Um, sort of concurrently and um, also subsequently, other solutions for these kinds of problems arose. Um, for example, the CQA R package, which is built around a highly compressed um, data, structure for genetic data, and then these sort of like systems like HALE and OpenCGA, which are designed for containing all genetic variation, use well, um, uh, set on distributed database systems. Um, so our approach was to go for something a bit more lightweight and that would enable us to use a relational database so we could write SQL queries enabling us to query the data. Um, typically for a large sequencing study of whole genome sequences with tens of thousands of samples, um, you're really going into tens of billions of rows. And so this is um, in a, if you're going to have a table of genotypes. And so that really pushes the boundary of what's possible with a relational database. However, if you're just looking at the rare variants, you can reduce the uh, number of genotypes that you store um, by 99% if you threshold at, um, an allele frequency of one in a thousand. So we use this sort of probabilistic threshold for allele frequency based on NOMAD, where we take into account the frequency within each subpopulation within NOMAD. And so we developed this system, which we call Reservoir, which is our relational database schema for sc storing the data and the set of tools that you can use to query it and build it. So this plot just shows you the um, proportion of all the uh, the proportion of variants, which are sort of reservoir variants in the sense of this allele frequency threshold in, in the 100,000 Genomes Project, broken down by ancestry. So um, on the left, we've got the 
um, proportion of um, all of the non homozygous reference genotypes that we keep for each group, and then the total number on the right. So you can see that, you know, we have an average sort of, if you average across the, um, the proportions of all of the ancestries, then you're looking at an average of about 25,000 rare variants per sample. And so, you know, with a, with a study of say um, 10,000 people, you'd have about 250 million genotypes <clears throat> that you want to store. So this is a reduction of 99% um, percent and the database, and it's not actually um, targeting compression necessarily, it's, it's mainly about being able to house it in a relational database. Um, so even though you're not trying to optimize compression, you're still, um, you still get very good compression. So we reduced the size of the VCFs down from, um, I think it was six terabytes down to a, a database all inclusive of 30 gigabytes. So it's a, it's a good, good reduction in size and we get the convenience of using SQL queries to access the data. So just a little bit under the hood of what's going on with reservoir. This, this diagram shows you how a reservoir database is constructed and what it contains. As in green, we have the tables. So we have the three core tables which contain genetic, ta uh, genetic data, which is the variant table um, where you have a variant ID and then columns corresponding to annotation that you would get from very large files that you want to store in the database and you don't want to have to uh, query on the fly. Um, we have a genotype table, which has, again, the, a variant ID and a sample ID, and then a, a, a genotype, which is either, uh, which we only store the non homozygous, sorry, we only store the non reference genotype. So these would be either one for a heterozygote or two for homozygote. And so these two columns, the variant ID that links to the variant table, and the sample ID would link to a sample a table of samples. And then we have a, a consequence table where we store the again the variant ID, a transcript ID, and um, and a number that encodes the uh, sequence ontology consequences of the variant. One of the aspects of reservoir is that variants are encoded as 64-bit integers. So that is the chromosome position, um, reference, and alternate allele can all be encoded as one of these um, as long as the alternate allele is up to nine bases in length. If it's more than nine bases in length, it's just truncated. And so you would have duplicate. Um, so you, you would have ambiguously stored um, variant IDs, which like, could correspond to multiple actual variants. However, that is uh, extremely unusual and you can unambiguously represent 99 based on Nomad. You can unambiguously represent 99.2% and uniquely represent 99.7% of all variants. And so it's, it's convenient um, for several reasons. Um, one is that it's fairly space efficient. Another is that you can store variants in order of position. So you can do a regional uh, location-based query just on the genotype table, for example, without having to do um, jo SQL joins to other tables, which makes uh, querying um, substantially faster depending on the database system that you're using. It, um, and so just to walk through it, the, the first bit is zero, is, um, uh, is redundant. Then there's five bits to store the chromosome. So there's, um, you know, 32 possible options, which is, you know, sufficient for 25 chromosomes. There's the position, 28-bit integer, um, and then reference length, alternate allele length, and then the next 18 bases, uh, sorry, the next 18 bits, each pair stores um, one of the, um, either A, T, C, or G for each base in the alternate allele. Another um, way in which 64-bit integers are used in reservoir is to store the consequence ID. There are fewer than 64 different sequence ontology varying consequences. So you can store any combination of consequences using a 64-bit ID. 
And if you store the consequences in order of severity, then you can very easily use these IDs to sort by the severity of consequences in uh, SQL query. So it's a sort of added convenience, but it's also a compression without um, requiring an additional table to decode the um, consequence IDs and uh, linking um, specific variants to a consequence and uh, sorry, um, without having a, an additional table to have to join to. And it's a very extensible system, so you can add additional tables and you can use the um, the tool that supplements Reservoir, um, which we developed the RSVR tool, which is available on GitHub, which um, can encode the variants as RSVR IDs. If you put one of these IDs in a table and index, um, index that column, then you can include a table um, for using um, in rapid queries within a reservoir, within an existing reservoir database. Yeah. Um, so just to give you um, uh, an example of the type of query that you could write, and um, this query would, uh, it looks a, a little bit horrendous, but considering that this is an alternative to writing, if you were going to use um, say BCF tools, it would be an alternative to writing a script that would have to um, uh, read the data in and then join to a table of um, read another file with phenotypes and match all of the IDs, etc. cetera. Um, so here what we're doing is we're selecting um, a sample name, variant information, um, prom, pause, ref, and alt, which can all be obtained by decoding the RSVR ID. Um, the CAD score, the um, the name of the disease from the literature, and we and then what this query is asking is give us everyone who uh, give us all of this information for people who have missense variants, um, also who also have thrombocytopenia and a and and the variant affects uh, the gene actin in one, and so uh, given the you know in a large data set was. Um, lots of different sources of phenotype information and genetics and annotation to be able to write a query like this succinctly is very useful. This query would also be um, as part of the reservoir scheme were available as a stored procedure in the database. So, so it, there would be a, you would be able to do this um, in a simpler, more parameterized way. Um, another, another aspect of having this reservoir database is that um, is just an SQL database, so it's very easy to host it on a web server. So we have a simple web app called Chromescope, which you can, which makes it easy to share this sort of rich, these rich data sets with um, collaborators who don't um, necessarily do bioinformatics and have server level access to the data. So um, this is just an example where you could search for a gene and then see a list of the rare variants in that gene, which samples carry those variants. And then by clicking on the sample IDs, you see in, in this panel on the right, see what phenotypes they have and additional information about them. Um, oh, just to just say, um, we, we have various reservoirs um, built at the minute, including reservoirs in the 100,000 Genomes Project, various studies in the US, the UK Biobank, um, and um, yeah, and we're, we're building more uh, all, the, all the time for upcoming studies. Um, so now just moving on to statistics, um, we have a, a method that is designed for rare diseases, um, rare monogenic diseases, uh, which takes as Tim put a case control status and um, the, a set of rare variants within a locus. There's, um, it's a Bayesian method. It stands for Bayesian Evaluation of Variant Involvement in Mendelian Disease. It was published in the American Journal in 2017. And so it's essentially a, a model comparison between a, a model with no association and models with dominant and recessive association. And you can also average over different classes of variants. So it therefore enables you to infer a posterior probability of association between the gene 
and the, the given disease, but also infer the mode of inheritance where there's a latent vector of uh, individual variant pathogenicity, which is model, which is the Z variable. So individual variant probabilities of pathogenicity can be inferred. Um, and um, essentially the, the association model is that your disease risk depends on um, the configuration of alleles. And uh, so that's the, uh, the G vector for an individual I. And so um, under a dominant model, if the sum of the um, non-homozygous, the, the sum of the genotypes at the um, pathogenic variants, um, conditional on the, the state of Z, is greater than one, i.e. you have at least one pathogenic allele, then your disease risk is um, pi, which is a pi risk. And if it's zero, then it's tau. And equivalently for recessive inheritance, if the sum of your um, non-homozygous if pathogenic alleles is greater than your ploidy S um, for individual SI for individual I in that locus, then you have the high risk. And then the, the priors on the individual um, the individual varying levels of pathogenicity are um, linked to a background rate, omega, and um, a scaling factor times um, like a, a given variable related to that variant. So that could be um, based on evolutionary conservation scores or some other co-data that you want to include. Um, so um, we run this method um, on on a gene on rare variants selected in the gene. Um, we threshold on one in a thousand if it's a dominantly inherited, sorry, one in a thousand if it's recessively inherited, one in 10,000 if it's dominant. And then we go through every case. We treat the a rare disease cohort with a mixture of different disease classes. We treat everyone who is a case for one particular disease um, as cases and everyone else for all other disease types of controls within each analysis. And then we systematically go through all of the disease tag gene pairs. So um, in the 100,000 Genomes project, we started by building a reservoir from the rare variants extracted from a merged VCF containing 77,539 participants. We determined um, case control groupings based on the disease classifications which are given in the 100,000 Genomes um, uh, projects in the Genomics England research environment I'll talk more about in a moment. We selected variants in 60,000 genes, 20,000 coding, 40,000 non-coding, and then we used BevyMed for each disease gene um, pair to infer a posterior probability of pathogenicity, I'll refer to as a PPA. Um, so just a quick look at the variant annotation data that was obtained. This shows the structure within the sequence ontology um, of each type of variant consequence and the number of variants that were annotated with each. So, um, and each of these, each of these little um, bar charts shows the break, the allele frequency breakdown based on thresholds of allele frequency within Nomad. The, um, the little black bar charts show the distribution of CAD scores within each consequence. Um, um, I, I, as one might expect, you can see that the, the distribution of CAD scores for stop gain variants, for example, is, is much more weighted to the over 30 um, CAD thread scores um, in comparison with um, other, other, types of, other types of variants. Um, so the disease, the disease, uh, the case sets that we established for running BevyMed were based on the specific diseases. So everyone in 100,000 Genomes Project is assigned one of 220 specific diseases. Um, and then the specific diseases are arranged hierarchically. So they're arranged into disease subgroups and then disease groups. And this diagram shows um, the case sets that we established broken down by disease group in order to account for a degree of phenotypic heterogeneity or differences in um, clinical presentation, we treated both the uh, specific disease and 
disease subgroup as case sets. So here, the disease subgroups are in blue. So those uh, bars look a little bit longer because there's these umbrella case sets. And um, just zone in on one example, neurology and neurodevelopmental disorders on the right. Um, so neurodevelopmental disorders is the biggest disease subgroup within that. And then within that, intellectual disability is the most common, uh, is the most frequent dis specific disease. So we, we applied Levy measure to each of these case sets and each gene and recorded the, post, the PPAs, the theory of probabilities of association for each one. And these are the results organized by um, the disease group of the case set. So the specific disease, the, the name of the case set isn't given, but you can see the name of the gene on the x-axis and then the PPA is on the y-axis. The color comes from the panel app database um, of associations. So that's based on this is sort of expert crowdsourced um, a database of associations where they use a green color to indicate strong evidence of or confirmed association and um, amber and then red for lower levels of evidence. So um, here the gray dots are the unlabeled sort of panel app absent results of which there are 19. So there's 260 results overall, um, 241 were known and then 19 um, were unknown. And then in um, our paper where we presented the results of this coding analysis, we um, followed up three of these, which I'll come on to shortly, and then um, an additional one in, so those were in blue, and then there's an additional one, um, which is verified independently by another group that was a uh, tough one, which causes um, epidemiolysis below zone. So um, the, um, one of these results um, was an association that was between rare variant um, lo uh, loss of function variants in ERG and the disease, uh, the case set primary lymphedema. The um, there was what um, so these these um, three pedigrees on the left in red and white show the um, does, uh, the pedigrees which drove the association. You can see one of them, uh, the, the, the additional pedigree was, was actually a replication that was a, originally labeled, uh, this person was originally labeled with a different disease. Um, however, on because they had a frame shift variant in ERG, we got in contact with the clinician and they confirmed that they had, they did actually have lymphedema uh, as well. And so, um, this 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 was obviously another case. There was one of in one of the pedigrees, the father was affected, but they um, were called homozygous reference. And so we looked at the distribution of the um, we looked at the distribution of the number of reads that supported this um, particular ERG um, frame shift that they had um, across the whole cohort and. We uh, noticed that the, the father had two reads supporting the variant com in comparison with the rest of the cohort for which there was um, at most one read supporting it. And so uh, because of this, we concluded that the father was uh, most likely a mosaic. And it also explains why their phenotype potentially was milder as their lymphedema set on two decades later in life than did the, uh, the phenotype for the, for the affected daughter. And so because, the, because two of these variants were observed in uh, the final exon of the ARG, um, they reputatively escape um, from nonsense mediated decay. And so we used uh, immunofluorescence to study the effect in the cell. Um, HEC, uh, HEC 293 cells uh, don't express ERG, so we used overexpression um, of the wild type and the mutant. Um, and we observed that the um, ERG uh, localizes outside the nucleus in the mutant um, and inside in the wild type, which suggests 
suggest the mechanism of disease. So um, another, the next result that we uh, followed up was an association between um, truncating variants in PMFA1 and familial thoracic aortic aneurysm disease. We had three variants, sorry, we had one variant observed in three unrelated European families, um, which drove the association. Um, and so we, in order to, uh, you know, get further evidence of the association, we looked up um, these these variants in other collections. We found we found three we found uh, in three other collections. Um, we replicated it, including a collection of Japanese pedigrees who had exactly the same phenotype, and um, and then two two additional ones which are shown in Figure A. We then, for the people who had been HBO coded, so HBO meaning human phenotype ontology, standardized um, vocabulary for capturing like typically rare disease phenotypes. For the people who had been HBO coded, we tried to see whether these people were more phenotypically homogeneous than you would expect at random conditional on having the case label, which was familial uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm disease. Um, and we used, um, we defined a metric for phenotypic um, homogeneity, which is, we originally used in um, um, many, many years ago in bleeding and platelet disorders study that was published in Westbury uh, 2015 in genome medicine. Um, so we used um, a group wise phenotypic similarity. So we defined the phenotypic similarity of a group of people as the average pairwise sim phenotype similarity between people from the same group. And that, and that individual level phenotype similarity was based on the resonant um, semantic similarity metric, um, which, um, like, which, which you could look up in the, the Westbury et al. paper. And so when we did this, we compared these four families for whom we had HBO coding with I think about 600 families out of, um, oh yeah, so 589 families from the 100,000 Genomes Project who had familial from, um, aortic aneurysm. Um, and we, we compared them to random sets of four and looked at the distribution of the phenotypic homogeneities and found that there was a, um, a p-value of five, five times 10 to the minus three. So um, giving us stronger confidence that the association was real. Then we looked at the, the signif within that, um, we looked at this um, significant, the statistically significant HPO phenotypes um, to find out what that phenotype was. And we observed these skeletal pheno phenotypes, for example, uh, dolichocephaly um, and abnormal axial skeletal morphology. Um, and these phenotypes were reminiscent of Lois Dietz syndrome. And so we then used the string, the string DB database to look at the um, physical protein interactions between genes that were in the, um, the that were on the familial thoracic aortic aneurysm disease um, gene panel from panel app. The and then included um, PMF A1 in this set. And um, you note know that PMF A1 um, has um, two, uh, it had two interactions which were with SMAD2 and SMAD3. And so, you know, this sort of uh, made us even more confident in the biological relevance of this gene to the, to the disease. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we conclude that these result, these variants result in lowest deep syndrome. And then finally, we validated the association between GPR156 between um, loss function variants in GPR156 and non syndromic recessive hearing loss. So there were two, um, the association was driven by two pedigrees who, between them, had two different variants, which are shown by the A and the B um, characters in the pedigree diagram. So you can see how it was inherited. We then found a replication um, in a consanguineous pedigree for whom there were uh, four affected daughters and 
um, an unaffected heterozygous son. Um, in order to, um, uh, and then re recently this, um, recently GPR156 was, um, there was a paper that linked it to um, stereocilia function. Um, and so we looked at uh, the log fold change um, between hair cells and surrounding cells in mice um, and looked at this log fold change across, of, um, of expression across all genes. So on the left, we have uh, genes that um, were not homologous to um, any, um, any or we looked at all the mouse genes that were not homologous to any gene on the hearing loss panel. And then on the right, we've got um, the ones that were homologous to genes on the panel partitioned by whether or not they had um, an associated geo a gene ontology term for stereocilia function. And you can see that the, um, the position of GPR156 um, fits most snugly into this, um, dis this red distribution of the genes which had the, um, which were annotated with the, the geo term. Uh, so that made us a, um, a somewhat more, more confident. Um, again, um, like with PMFA1, two of these variants occurred in the last exon, so could escape nonsense mediated decay. And so um, we transfected COS7 cells with wild type and all of the GPR156 mutants and um, looked at expression with a Western blot experiment and you know observed uh, clearly the um, expression is reduced in all of the in all of the mutants. Uh, so we concluded that uh, this was a, a genuine association. That was um, this paper was published last year in Nature Medicine, um, and so if you want any more information about it, and it also describes the, the reservoir system, then uh, you can uh, uh, look at look at this paper. Um, so, and then more recently, we then um, took the results of the non-coding genes, and I'm just going to uh, present one of the. Um, so one of the disease classes that we analyzed, which was intellectual disability. And for this disease class, there was only a single gene which obtained a posterior a PPA of above 0 0.5, which was RNU42. There were three variants which obtained a uh, posterior probability above uh, an individual variant level probability of pathogenicity of above 0.5, which is shown here. The one the highest is this um, insertion of a T at base 64. Or there were 34 cases who carried one of these three variants with a high probability. All of them were unexplained, which is a lot more than we expected at random, um, given the rate of um, diagnosis of this particular disease in the 100,000 Genomes Project um, through their diagnostic pipeline, which was 80% sorry, 80% uh, unexplained. So we did a one-sided um, binomial test with 34 trials and an expectance of 0.8, we obtained a p-value of 4.86 and 10 to the minus 4, so adding, adding evidence uh, to the um, association. We then repeated the phenotypic homogeneity as described for uh, the PMFA1 association. So again, we took, uh, we're testing to see if this set of 34 people with the variant is more homogeneous than you'd expect amongst 34 random people who have the uh, who have intellectual disability. So this gray distribution shows the null, the null distribution of um, these homogeneity scores calculated for these random sets based on a million replicates. And then the red line shows the actual homogeneity for our 34 with the variance. And we have a P and from this we've got a p-value of 2.33 times 10 to the minus 5. So more, more evidence still. And um, this, this diagram, um, oh, so then, then we looked at the um, specific HBO and ICD-10 ICD phenotypes of these, of the controls who had one of these um, implicated variants. And we noticed that there was a lot of overlapping phenotypes with the people who um, drove the association in the first place. So they weren't actually labeled with intellectual disability, 
but they had um, overlapping terms, including things that were to do with mor morphological brain abnormalities, uh, seizures, um, et cetera. And so um, in order to capture as many cases as possible, we expanded the definition of effectiveness to include uh, these, um, any, any um, neurodevelopmental abnormalities, I call them NDA here, um, re related HPO or ICD-10 code. And then we also um, noticed that people who carried variants that were adjacent to these implicated variants also had the same phenotypes. So we expanded the areas which, in which we selected variants up to where there were no unaffected people carrying um, the variants. And by doing these two, two things, we increased the number of cases that we were looking at to um, from 34 to 47, and 37 of them, um, which is kind of incredible, were um, had evidence of de novo inheritance. So it'd be very unusual to find, um, and uh, the only example I know of where so many people have the same de novo variant um, and um, all, all having exactly the same phenotype. So these, all of these 37 have um, that had parental genotype data that suggested this, and then the remaining 10 we had insufficient data to know whether it would be de novo or not. Uh, so in this diagram, you can see every position of the RNA, RNA 42 genes, 141 bases long, and these are the, uh, the bases of the cDNA, and for each base, you can see the number of people who carry a rare allele at that position, um, and it's partitioned by um, the to know whether it's uh, whether they are cases or whether they um, have inherited the variant de novo or whether it's unknown. So the, the reddish colors show cases and the darkish colors show de novo. Um, and you can see the the implicated variants. Um, it's probably quite hard to see, but these they are in bold and then the the critical regions that we expanded to in order to increase our um, selection of cases are in, in this sort of yellow color. Um, then uh, at right in the bottom, you can see the uh, uh, GAD track, which just indicates whether the variant is observed in NOMAD or not. The variants observed in NOMAD um, have a little circle. And so one thing you can see straight away is that in these critical regions, um, there's, a, there's an obvious depletion of variation in nomad suggestive um, of negative selection and um, there's a, obviously there's one specific variant which happens to be the, the si position 64 insertion of a T which explains nearly all of these um, all of these cases so there's one very predominant variant. Uh, we then looked at the distributions of the numbers of reads supporting each of these variants across the whole cohort. Um, so you can see the homozygous reference, um, people called homozygous reference for each variant are in gray and people called heterozygous are in red. And it happens to be that everyone who's heterozygous is also a case in the sense of having um, a neurodevelopmental abnormality. And in all instances, um, the, the number of reads supporting the allele in um, the homozygotes are less than three, uh, three or less, and in the heterozygotes are at least nine, with a, um, with a single exception, um, which was for the 65 A to G variant, where the mosaic, sorry, where the mother of one of the probands uh, had eight supporting reads, um, which is shown in this uh, little diagram here. The support, the reads supporting the alternate allele are in blue, and the reference are in grey. And so, um, looking looking at this uh, distribution is like clear from the ratios that we that the uh, the mother is uh, a mosaic. Okay. Uh, the, we replicated this finding in three other cohorts, uh, including the NHS uh, GMS, which is um, uh, sorry, genomic medicine service, um, who provide data in the. Um, uh, the Genomics England research environment that can comprise 25,000 um, samples with five, five and a half thousand cases of neurodevelopmental abnormality. Um, also the NIHR bioresource um, for whom there were like a, a, an additional 7,000 cases. 
uh, sorry, 7,000 samples with, I, I think, about 600 cases of neurodevelopmental abnormality. Um, and the and the Genomics England pilot study, for which there are 4,000 4, samples. So um, here, here we can see all of the, the pedigrees that we now have with any variant in the uh, critical, in any of the critical regions, the people from the 100,000 Genomes Project, the Discovery cohort, i.e. The, the original 47 are shown with black labels and the replicates are shown with blue labels. And you can see that, um, you can see the, the effect that the cases are in red, homozygous reference um, sequenced individuals have a zero and the heterozygotes all have a letter uh, dictating which variant they um, have been called with. And you can see that the, the variant that is the most common, the C variant, um, which is this base 64 insertion, is also the most common amongst the replicates, explaining two thirds of these replicate cases. And um, interestingly, we have um, a case of no inheritance. So this variant is the uh, 76 C to G, which um, may, be, may indeed be a benign variant. And an additional, in addition, we have one um, case of inheritance, which is for the I variant, the 76 C to T. Um, this was a, the, these people had a milder phenotype just being coded with um, moderate intellectual disability being their only neurological HBO term. And um, it is also, the, this is also the only variant observed in nomads. So we might conclude that the variants of this position, 76, are um, more uh, like less, uh, less penetrant or um, have caused a milder phenotype. So um, in order to characterize the phenotype, we created this diagram um, in which we show the HBO terms of the 46 of, 46 of the discovery cohort for whom um, the term neurodevelopmental abnormality was assigned. And um, in, the, in the diagram, we show terms which are either, uh, which are present in at least five of the 46 and either in more than half of them or that are significantly enriched relative to um, the other people from the 100,000 genomes who have um, neurodevelopmental abnormality. The, uh, and this is um, significant um, based on uh, a Fisher exact test of presence of the HBO term that was uh, born for only corrected with a significance threshold of 0 0.05. And we, we show the, the significant terms in yellow. The little red arrows show the difference in proportion between the two sets, um, the base of the arrow being the, the non-RNU42 carrying NDA cases and the head of the arrow being the, the um, proportion amongst the RNU42 cases. Uh, and then the number shows the number out of 46 and the, the percentage is the proportion of the 46. So just to, um, so you can see from the direction of all of the arrows that this set of people is not um, under enriched for any term. And also, um, um, just, just to pick out a few examples the, of the phenotype, generalized hypotonia, um, microcephaly, seizure, a proportion of short, short stature, and drooling are some of these characteristic phenotypes for this disease. Um, so just a quick look at the, the prevalence. We calculated uh, the prevalence in two cohorts in the 100,000 Genomes Project and in the GMS. In the 100,000 Genomes Project, the um, RNU42 RNU is the by far the most prevalent cause of neurodevelopmental abnormality, which is kind of amazing that it's um, sort of been lurking in the data until um, uh, sort of recent times. So, um, but, of, but of course the 100,000 genome project screens against known causes. So to get a, so this, this was this accounted for 0.5% um, of all neurode uh, neurodevelopmental abnormality. Um, but of course the 100,000 genomes screens against known causes. So we thought um, a better estimate of population prevalence would be from the genomic medicine service. 
uh, where only um, they only screen against aneuploidy, copy number variants, uh, short tandem repeat, and short tandem repeats and abnormal methylation. So, um, looking in this cohort um, at the um, and here, the, just uh, as one clarification: these are the, the the numbers of people from each cohort who have um, who've been labelled as solved and have a, li a labelled likely pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant. So in the GMS cohort, only MECP2, which is the, um, the uh, well-known cause of Rett syndrome, um, had more cases with 24 explained relative to 21 explained for RNU42, um, which accounted for 0.38% uh, of all of the 5,500 um, individuals with neurodevelopmental neuro abnormalities. Um, so, um, okay, so this this diagram shows uh, the interactions between the U4 and U6 sRNAs with the highlighted critical regions in yellow. You can see that the highlighted regions um, are where uh, are, are within the regions where these two molecules bind. Um, and so these are these are in the stem three and quasi pseudonot regions, and they occur on either side of this ACA GAGA loop. This um, this sequence is what binds to the five prime splice site of target introns, and so is important for spliceosome activation. And so we might um, sort of hypothesize that disrupt that these variants disrupt these bonds, and therefore. Um, disrupt uh, spliceosome activation, and it will need um, you know, more experimental validation to um, to determine the uh, yeah to find the the real cause. So this paper is on, only just only just published thirty um, first of May, so just um, just about two weeks ago. And um, uh, so yeah, if you want any more details on that, you can. Uh, look at that uh, publication. So I'd just like to conclude by um, giving a shout out to the sort of core team that's been involved in this, which is myself, um, Professor Ernest Turo at um, Mount Sinai, um, Andrew Mumford, who's here with us today, and Kathleen Frazon um, in Belgium, and to thank uh, John Rick's England for providing the data and all of the patients, um, and also our funders, and then this um, NHS NIHR, MRC, Wellcome Trust, CRUK, NHSBT, NIH, and KB Levin. And uh, yeah, that's it. So um, thanks for listening. Any questions? Yeah. Not sharing, so then we'll be yeah. able to see questions from outside. Thanks very much. That was that was yeah. great. Um, okay. <laughs> questions from in the room. Is anybody? Um, if anybody online has a question, then either just unmute yourself and shout out or put your hand up. Yes, you mentioned um, about it being, you haven't seen that many de novo mutations within. So have we got any idea why that is? Is there something special about that area? Um, I, I am I, not, as a non-biologist, um, I, I don't know, it's clearly hypermutable at that point. I don't understand. I, I don't know why. Yeah, we're, it's also a hypermutable part of that gene mm -hmm. that explains the very unique distribution of variants. The fact that cases arise de novo, that's normally an addictive sign that the phenotype is consistent yeah. with reproductive potential. Yeah. There's been an, an amazing new development about the observations now that we now a little bit more, even since publication of this paper, that the very rare cases where there is transmission, they are exclusively female to female. Um, and that's unusual. Um, and there's an intriguing twist here that we, we hypothesize here that the variants disrupt function of the major spicy zone, the thing that's responsible for removing introns, of course, from coding genes, possibly in some critical tissues. Neuro, for example. But there's now some emerging data that properly functioning major spicy zones are important for function of spermatozoa, and that would be a really nice explanation as well. We don't get 
We don't apparently have any examples of male to female transmission. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there, and then there's two people oh. online. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mentioned in the beginning that you compressed the six terabytes of data down to 30 gigs. Could you tell us more about that? Um, so it was not trying to, it's, it's not trying to take all of the data from the VCF. So the VCF contained other data as well. Mm -hmm. So we were taking the bit that we, that we wanted. So it's, it, I, I wouldn't, I, 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 I wouldn't, I, I shouldn't claim that it's, um, compressing the six terabytes and 30 gigs. Like firstly, we're getting rid of the common variants. We're get, getting rid of any annotations, which are in the VCF, um, so, so yeah, it's a it's it's a subset of the data. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. I thought I could see comments in the chat from two people, but now I don't seem to be. If you, oh yeah, um, yeah. So from Jib, um, Jib, are you able to unmute yourself and talk to us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that was a that was a great talk. Thanks so much, Daniel. Um, yeah, I just put a few questions in the chat. I, I, I was just putting them as as you were going along. Is it really? Yeah, it was a really nice talk. I mean, the first one is really um, trivial, but like you could use hashes for longer allele codes. Did you did you consider using a hash for the alt alleles when they were longer than nine? Oh, sorry, eighteen. I can't remember how many it was uh, characters. Yeah, uh, yeah, we had, um, we had, um, we we don't uh, typically use it because um, we're not doing. I, I guess with this, we haven't been doing like clinical grade, like really needing to know. We kind of find this. We've been using it to sort of find the associations rather than um, like try and guarantee that we store the information exactly faithfully. But as part of the implementation, we did put. Um, a way of having an overspill table um, to uh, decode those um, rarer instances where there are, um, you know, uh, where, where there's an amb amb ambiguity. So um, not exactly using a, a hash table, but like a method of, you know, decoding uh, uh, this uh, variance in that situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I I have a couple more questions, but I I don't want to take up all the time. Are there other people? Um, I, go ahead? I think Josine is waiting. Um, cool. Josine, do you want to ask your yeah. question? Yeah. I also, go back I, to yeah. I also have a few questions. I, I think so. So really nice talk, uh, Daniel. Really impressive. Um, so I have been. A uh, long time ago, I worked on the UK 10K project uh, where we generated um, sequence data and also in trios. Um, and where we really struggled with was like trying to replicate those rare variant associations um, because of the, I think the trouble was, I guess, that you might find like the read depth or the coverage is not equally distribution between data sets. So how 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 would you what do you think is a good way to replicate your findings? Um well, in all we so I'm not I, I'm I hope having this is going to answer your question, but as part of the QC um procedure we ensure that all of the um like we do cohort wide variant filtering. So um, we look, we, we don't use individual sample level quality scores to filter our variants. We, we, look at, um, we look at overall pass rates or like the median quality, um, you know, these are all parameters that you can, um, that are inputs to our, um, our procedure when we make the database. Um, so does, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, but then it's still because you know if you have only a few families or a few trios with like a rare variant, so how do you know it's not like, I guess, an an sequencing error? I oh, mean, I, compared I, compared to, I, you know, how do you think it's really related to the disease? 
I, I, I understand. Um, yes, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. There's always an issue with rare variant, uh, with rare diseases and rare variants. So we, th this is why we do the sort of biological, like we, we will often do Sanger sequencing um, as a follow-up. And we, um, you know, if we're, we're, we're really confident, we'll just, we'll just do experiments um, to validate the, the findings. In this, in, in the case of RNA 4 too, I mean, there's, um, we do have Sanger sequencing for one of the samples that I know of, but there's so there's so much data, there's so many examples in this database. It, it, like it was sufficient, um, but yeah, typically we would do um, uh, biological validation. No, I can okay. confirm here that we already translated this gene discovery into the Diagnostic Laboratory. And my team in the genetics laboratory here in North Bristol are now reporting officially these cases. And they will not do that unless there's independent validation using an orthogonal technology on an independently collected DNA sample or independently stored. And it goes without saying that these are these are real. Really cool. Really sure, really. Yeah. Right. It, um... And my second question is related to so in in Bristol we have um, we're working with the Cleft Collective, and 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 we are, we are, we are making plans to do sequencing. So I'm just wondering whether you have sequenced Cleft cases as well. Uh, we 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 don't have uh, sequence. Um, well, I mean not not in the hundred thousand genomes. I'm not aware of it as a uh, as a cohort at in the 100,000 Genomes Project. Okay. Um, Thanks. Um, yeah, no worries. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, you one question for you, collaborator. But, um, Daniel, it's been an absolute pleasure over actually more than 10 years to assist with the early development of BetaMed to test it originally in rare hematological disorders and now sequentially applying it to uh, rare variants and coding genes and now non-coding genes. It's been wonderful. The thing that I've always been willing to ask about Bethanhead <laughs> is, um, um, there's never been a better time of it. Uh, it seems to have an extraordinarily low false discovery rate association and very high posterior probability theory, driven by tiny numbers of cases, you know, sometimes two or three pedigrees. And I just wondered if you could or speculate as to what's special about that you know, that enables how to use these really unique and powerful properties. From the, for sorry, it's um, designed for specifically for um, Mendelian inheritance of monogenic disorders. But the the thing that has really set the results apart, um, or the, the thing that that makes the results very high quality, is a lot of it is down to the like very stringent post-processing based on um um you know do, doing things like um then looking at the family structures correcting for um pipeline errors by sort of running it or like batch effects by running it with by using the batch as the case label and um um various um the post-processing measures that we out outline in the um, like Nature Medicine 2023 20 paper. So there's a lot, there's a lot of results that are removed. So there's a lot of false positives removed like that. Um, so yeah, it's a combination of yeah the design for specifically Mendelian diseases and the post-processing. Great. Um, I'm going to bring it to a close. Um, and that's a nice thing to end on as we go forward. So for those of you who are here in the building, we're just going to go down to our staff room and, and have lunch together. And then we have a, a meeting with a group of us in a room called BG10 downstairs, which I can show you where it is, if any of you don't know, where we'll continue to this, this discussion. And I think one of the things that's of particular interest for us is looking at the rare variants in relation to traits and diseases that are not necessarily rare and not necessarily Mendelian and, and how that might be taken forward. Um, for those of you who are online who want to join that meeting, which I think is planned to start at half past one, um, 
and you haven't already put your name in, then just if you email Marie, she'll be able to send you the link to join that meeting. And I'd like to thank Daniel and, and Andrew also for coming along and, and your group to this um, one more time. So thank you very much. That was great. Thank you very much.